Well, good morning to all you happy gardeners. It's that time of year when we've got some essential harvesting to do. At least I have anyway. But first of all, I meant to do this a week or so back because these peppers are really leaning over with the weight of the fruit. So I'm going to just see if I can prop them up delicately. And it's quite difficult. The central stem is right over and on the side of the pot. So there we are. And I'm just going to use a tie for now. Keep it in place. And these peppers, they're green at the moment. They're not huge, but there's a lot of them. And I think what I'm going to end up doing is just leaving them to carry on, see if they actually turn and get a bit riper. Quite happy using them as green peppers, but I do like the odd red one now and then. And you do get an in-between color with these. Right, that's that one. Let's see if I can get the other one stood up and then I can move them across a bit. There we go. And we'll just get him in to one of these lateral stems, I think, because it just needs to hold it in place. But I can see in there, I've got one pepper that's turning and I might thin these out a little in a short while just to see if that results in a few bigger ones. I mean, that is the normal way of things with certainly with apples and things like that. Obviously it gives it more focus on the remaining fruit. You can see there's absolutely tons there. There's one in there that's turning. There's one there that's covered in leaves. Right, so I can move across and I can give it a bit of a clean up now. And get this one across too. And then I'm gonna go on to the tomatoes because I've got to that point where there's so many on the bushes, I definitely need to get some indoors, get them cropped. That one's a bit worse for wear. Right, let's go. I think following today's harvest, there's gonna be a lot of work in the kitchen because over the last few days, there's been, wow, an absolute deluge of crops that can be picked. And it just means that you get a real focus on the kitchen for a while while she gets things processed, cooked, and away in the freezer. And with the tomatoes, we've been making pasta sauce, and we've been adding a little bit of the basil that we cropped earlier on in the season and froze into cubes in oil. And we mix that in with some courgettes and maybe some peppers, and it results in a very nice pasta sauce that can be frozen and used during the course of the year. I think I'm gonna have a lot of green fallers here. Right, well, I'm gonna carry on picking and I'll show you the result of all my harvesting at the end. stop mid pick there so we've got four of those cherry tomato plants called house and this is probably the third or fourth pick I've had off of it absolutely incredible and those little plants I've potted them up twice they're in a sort of medium sized pot now and I've had to strip the leaves that have died today but I haven't stripped the leaves at any other time. I've just left them to their own devices. And well, that's probably the most prolific tomato plant I think I've ever had. So house, fantastic. I'll carry on now. Well, that's a pretty rosy crop. We've had quite a few tomatoes, especially off of this plum tomato. 
and this one Sarah Childs is seems to give us a fair few good and nicely developed tomatoes there's also one or two that have suffered a little bit from damage but you get a tomato like that that's a lot of feeding and we've picked a few of the red peppers as well because that would focus the rest of the green and yellow ones into becoming a bit more red so there we are that's a lovely crop and proportional to the other tomato plants that little cherry tomato does so well well my carrots have developed nicely I'm gonna carry on just watering them and keeping them going I do have to keep taking out this bindweed which is a bit of a pain but there we are it's a small price to pay in this bed for having a really good carrot crop and everything has bushed up quite a lot in the last couple of weeks you can see the height's got a lot better there's a few stinging nettles in here which I shouldn't really be taking out with my hands but I'm going to and I got a little bit of grass but generally I've kept the weeds down well and that at least makes sure that the carrots are not competing with anything else and once I get this last couple out I'll show you how they're doing because you can certainly see the tops of them now through the foliage there we are I think that's the worst of it a little bit there a little bit there yeah okay let's get in and I'll show you what they're looking like so let's get down and inside here so you can see this one here is that's not bad it's about an inch across and then we've got ones like this which are probably two inches across and they will get bigger as we get into the latter months of the summer and I'm not feeding them or anything like that there's another sting in it oh, I'll take him out let's just have a look at this one yep that's about an inch across so that is one of the bigger ones there but as I say, they will keep growing nicely and I'll keep watering them occasionally. I've stopped watering them prolifically because I think that at this time you want them to really be searching and going down. So I'm just a little bit frugal with the watering. Um, but I think things are working out at the moment and we should get a reasonable carrot crop. Well, this is turning into a bit of a harvest special and these onions bedfordshire champion they've been sadly hit quite badly by white rot but i think it's time to take them out these are the ones that have either bolted and i haven't bothered with or they seem to be doing okay so i'm going to take each one out as i did with the globo onions and just see whether they're okay or not if they are, I'm going to put them to one side to cure. If they're not, they're going into my harvesting pouch and I'll take them home. And with the others I've got at home, I'll do a bit of a session freezing them. And you might have seen on my Instagram, me wearing swimming goggles, because I find that's the best way to deal with a load of onions. So if you don't watch my Instagram, get on it. It's always a bit of fun. Right, I think we'll just start to pull these. So this one is bolted, the telltale sign of a flower at the top. And if I pull him, there's really no sign of white rot on him that I can see. So I think what I'm gonna do is put him in the to cure pot. Um, I'll stick them there for now. And this one is also bolted. And again, no signs of white rot so i'll work my way through the rest and we we'll see what we've got at the end so there we are that's the onion bed cleared and there's just a little bit of weeding to do in there but really won't take me very long and then I'll rake it over and the onions that had white rot are these and this one is probably the worst that I've seen out of all the onions and you can see how it's 
working its way into the onion and splitting it there. And that's one of the reasons why I'm taking them out now. I just don't want to get any worse than they are. And there's about six others in there that I'll be processing and getting into the freezer. And as far as the onions that are in good condition, well, there's a lot more. And that's because I've been pulling any out that have been troublesome. But you can see there's probably, what, eight, 12, about, about a dozen onions there that survived. And we'll just see if they'll store, fingers crossed. Well, these are the ones I took out last week and they're curing nicely. You can see the leaves are yellowing and dying back and we're getting a little bit of a, a brown hue to the outer skins of these other onions. And I'll probably turn these just so I get an even sort of um, effect on the onion on both sides. And it's leading me to think it's time to take out these Elsa Craig as well. And they're not particularly large, but same approach as the Bedfordshire Champion. Get them out, have a look at them and sort them into good and bad. Well, out of that batch of Elsa Craig, there was a few that were suffering from white rot. There was also a few that were clearly quite soft and then quite a lot of tiddlers. And I think that's because that area over there is quite shady, so it's not perfect for growing onions. So I put the small ones, the soft ones, and any that had signs of white rot, and there's a couple, into my let's process batch. So all in all, I've got a few that I need to get on and do something with and those will clear with all the others and hopefully we'll get some storing onions. So in the UK there's quite a lot of, I don't know whether it's scaremongering or whether it's genuine problem but the supply of food is a little bit in question because of the availability of drivers for HGV vehicles um, and also some import troubles. So vegetables are set to increase in price I fear and certainly it's going to be important to have some in the background stored if you're an allotment grower. So keep hold of your vegetables, look after them and now look after us. <laughs> Well, Mrs. K just came over and she said, I'm not really looking to process any vegetables today. Hmm. I think that meant, for goodness sake, don't harvest any more. But these will keep and they're just getting a bit big. And if I don't harvest them, they won't be usable. So I'm going to take them anyway. There's one giant one in here which might be a bit far gone. I'm getting down in the undergrowth and giving it a bit of a snip. It's not easy to get out, that's for sure. Here it comes. Yes, that one is just about usable, I reckon. So anything else that's desperate, there's a few here that are gonna come on over the next few days so they can wait. I think there's one more around there. Let's just have a quick look. I'm talking about large. I went and had a look in the pumpkin and squash bed this morning and I was pretty staggered at what I found. I'll show you. I think you can see there's a bit of yellowing of the leaves going on on the squash and pumpkins. And that's fine. We just want to see them gradually die back over time and we'll leave all the squash in place to mature where they are. 
and then when the sun starts to hit upon them then they'll start to cure nicely and that's when they usually change colour. So two exciting things to show you. The pond squash as it's now affectionately known is going bonkers. Look at this fella and that was actually pushing that rock away and I had to lift it up and let the rock go back so that it grew on top of the rock and that's ideal because there's no dampness underneath it. We've got another developing in there, another one in there. We've got one that's hanging over the top of the pond. We'll see how that goes. There are just so many in there. It's beginning difficult to see them all. Let's have a look in at this one. Yeah, that's another beauty there. But I was over here looking at my prize small sugar pumpkins, which are doing just brilliantly. You can see there's one there. And I got surprised by another one down in there. But as I cast my eye over here, there was an enormous yellow monstrosity over there. Let's go and have a look at him, because I just didn't know he was there. Let's get in. Just look at that beauty. And I'd like to tell you what he is, but the labels are stuck down in there and I can't really remember. But I will tell you in good time. I'm thinking that there'll be lots appearing like that one that I haven't seen before as the leaves start to decline. Oh, you can see the small sugar there, it's looking beautiful. And there's quite a few sort of peripheral ones developing, like this fella. And they'll be fine, they'll just make a nice small meal and probably take the top off and stuff something into the pumpkin. And there's some more just here, one down there. And I think we've got, yeah, another one there and quite a lot larger one here. So at the moment, it's looking like a pumpkin fest. I think we should have a really good crop. This wildlife pond has given us immense amounts of pleasure. It's been fantastic to watch the tadpoles turn into frogs and get out of the pond, and also to watch the newts, which have multiplied in the pond. I'm surprised that we've still got some tadpoles just swimming around the edges. They've been in here an awful long time, but who knows? Perhaps they're toads or something like that. I'm not sure. They've certainly been in there for a lot longer. But this morning, there was a fantastic occurrence which I hadn't seen before. And that's all those water boatmen along the edge. I don't know if you can see them. They're just like, well, incredibly young water boatmen just sitting in the weed. There's what, two, four, six, eight. In fact, they're all round the pond. So there obviously been some breeding of water boatmen inside, in, in the water, which is amazing. And well, everything seems to be enjoying this. And the lily has done nicely, leafing up. One or two are dying back now. And I guess the pond will start to shut down a little bit in a few weeks time. Well, it's sad to take any tree down, but this one I fear has had its day. And I showed a week or so back, I've got this damage on the trunk here, which I'll show you a bit more closely in a moment. And then this branch here started to wither and it's died and I've got the same sort of damage at the base. And then I noticed the other day there was a broken branch and when I've examined it, that too has that damage. And I think the wind just broke it off. So this apple tree is sadly fairly badly infected. And taking opinion, I've been advised that really it's time to take it out. And it's a shame because I put nine fruit trees into this whole area. And this one and one other has really been struggling. But before I get to the point where the other trees are too big, I can replace it 
with a tree of a similar size for not too big a cost. And so that's probably what I'll end up doing. So unfortunately, this one's gonna come out. Ironically, oh, it's got an apple. Did you see that catch then? They're thinking about asking me to play rug, not rugby, cricket for an international side. No, I'm joking. And this is a tiny little apple. So we will eat these because they are edible. They're nice and firm. But this tree sadly is coming out. So I'll uh, take away the wire, weed the bed, and then I'll show you the infection that's on here and then we'll get it out. So this is the initial damage you can see. It's about three inches long and it's gradually eating into the wood. And this is where the branch broke off. And again, you can see how it was infected and it's basically died and broken off. And there's more there at the base of this dead branch. So unfortunately with it down here in the way that it is, there really isn't a lot of chance for it. So. Let's take this fella out and then we'll clean up this bed and see where we go from there. Well, this pear has had a bad year, as a lot of fruit has this year. And a lot of our traditional apples in the UK have been badly affected. And the reason for that is that we had a really bright and warm early spell, and that brought out all the flowers, but it was before the insects were ready to pollinate. And that resulted in a lot of flowers and no fruit. And this tree has fallen foul to exactly that problem. But hopefully next year it'll bounce back as many people think it's nature's way of just giving fruit trees a bit of a rest. So I've got my long handled pruner. And what I'm gonna to do today is a bit of summer pruning, not a lot, but it's an opportunity to shape the tree. And as you can see, I've got a really strong leading branch going up and I just don't want that height. So that's gonna come down and I'm gonna just take a look around, see if there's anything else. But this is a really simple job. And there it goes. And I can see straight away that there's another, oops, another branch that I want to remove at the back. And maybe this one here. Let's see. Take him there. Now you have to be careful how much you prune like this because it does result in a lot of growth next year, what we call water shoots. So we don't want too many of those. So I'm just gonna do three branches. I'll get that other one. Well, this one's quite awkward to get to, but I'll take them out quite low. There he goes. And I've also noticed there's a bit of a dead branch in there, which has probably been snapped off by a large bird, like a pigeon. So I'm just gonna pull that down. And there we go. And that's all the pruning I'm gonna do on it for now. But we're just keeping a reasonable shape. And I'll probably need to take some of these lower ones away because they're just getting a bit long but we'll see how they go. Well, last week I showed you my broad beans in the basket I've made. Hopefully they'll be drying out nicely. And well, I looked this morning and I think they're interesting to look at. So, as you can see, 
they're turning nicely black and the outsides are really nice and crispy dry. So this is a really good method of drying pods and I'll be putting the runner beans in here too. Although the holes might be a bit big because I keep dropping them. Well, I do hope you've enjoyed today's video. And if you did, then please like and subscribe. And if you hit that bell, you get to know whenever I upload a video, which actually is every Wednesday and every Sunday at 8 p.m. Be there.